Welcome back to Ether Hour, everybody. I'm your host, Conrad Franz, joined as always by Dimitri Kalyagin, as well as a fantastic guest, somebody who I think we've been saying we want on the show for nine, ten months at this point. He finally joins us. We are joined by Father John Whiteford, rector of St. Jonah's Parish in the Russian Orthodox Church Abroad in Spring, Texas. Father John, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? Doing good. Thanks for having me on the show. It's a real honor, and yeah, this has been a conversation a long time coming. We're going to kind of have a bit of a a broader discussion on a few different topics, kind of facing the Orthodox world today, sort of in the realm of things we talk about on World War Now. But I think a place to start, just to hop right on in, the Assembly of Bishops actually just released a statement as of, you know, the same day this is being recorded in response to a series of articles, mostly the first one being published in Foreign Affairs, which is the outlet for the Council on Foreign Relations, and it was then picked up and repurposed in more salacious pieces in places like Newsweek and others. And that basically these articles accused uh, general orthodoxy, didn't even really only single out the Russian Orthodox Church that talked about Greeks and others, basically being fifth columnists for you know, I guess some Russian potential influence in the U.S. and sort of just sowing these seeds against the Orthodox faithful in America. I was pleased with the Assembly of Bishops statement, despite the fact that Rokor is currently not on the Assembly of Bishops uh, right now due to the current Ukrainian situation. Father John, I'm wondering your thoughts on the statement. Well, I was glad to see it. The These articles seem to be ramping up, you know, this uh, hysteria that our parishes are, are a threat to society. And I've been warning people for a while, particularly if, if the war in Ukraine have, ever actually escalates to where we have direct uh, fighting between American troops and Russian troops, things could get very ugly very quickly. And I, I don't think we'll have the courtesy of the same kind of treatment Muslims got after 911, where <clears throat> the media is telling everyone, oh, these people are peace loving and you know they surely wouldn't do anything bad don't don't take it out on the innocent uh i don't think we'll get any of that and you know our our parish had a terrorist threat against it back in the year 2000 and i think that it was not unrelated to the russia hoax uh, about the election and uh, the idea that somehow putin stole the election to get donald trump elected and um the FBI couldn't be bothered to actually track down the guy who did it, which they could have easily done had they any inclination to do. And we can see that from how they were able to track down anyone who was even close to the Capitol on January the 6th. Just recently, I was at the Ludwell Orthodox Fellowship Conference that was held in uh, North Carolina, and I was told after the fact that somebody who had worked for the federal government was telling uh, Rebecca Dillingham, or Dissident Mama, as she's also known, that there was some you know federal vehicle that was sitting outside of the conference center that was you know clearly uh, monitoring stuff. Right now, what I would suggest to people is if you have glowies visiting your parish, you know try to convert them. Just be nice to them, <laughs> offer them food, coffee, donuts, and uh, you know. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think that we, we're not going to be able to stop them from casing us out. We just need to be aware that that's likely to happen. The only thing I would say, though, is if you have anybody in your parish on the autism spectrum, you want to keep an eye on them to make sure that they don't get <laughs> talked into doing something stupid, because that's the, one of the modus operandi of the uh, uh, of the FBI is to get somebody who's, you know, not uh, very, very sh- sharp and, uh, you know, autistic and then talk them into putting some bomb together or something like that to uh, affect some plot that the FBI hatched from the beginning. And then they get on the news and say, oh, we busted an Al-Qaeda cell. Uh, well, you know, if, if they had that kind of news about a Russian parish in the United States, uh, that would ramp things up quite a bit. So that's the only thing I would say that we should keep our eyes out and be careful about. It sounds like very pertinent and practical advice, Father, especially given that, as I can imagine, it's similar to what, what's happening in the Ukraine. All it took was several, for example, several raids on a few on a few bishops and priests in order to find leaflets, books, which are perhaps anti-Ukrainian or maybe even too pro-Russian for an avalanche effect to begin for the uh, high rather to consider certain anti-Orthodox legislation or even begin pushing quite sort of you know, quite strongly against the entire, you know, faith in general in various jurisdictions. But I guess uh, it, on a positive note, it is very nice seeing the council, you know, 
the the bishop council even you know, notwithstanding Rokor not being a member of it actually speak out about it this article because i guess the article does as you mentioned does declare this um <clears throat> at least on, on the first front declares this uh, cultural war against all orthodoxy well in fact especially especially against the greeks who have been quite um you know the the greek orthodox parishes under the ecumenical patriarchate they have been very cooperative i would say with the state department as well as the other um sort of powers in the united states you know supporting the 9 11 memorial they had that big project they had um you know their involvement in uh, states such as new york have been very evident so and also you know even social movements such as the black lives matter movement or even these popular movements which in fact they don't bring many fruits but they do in fact uh, signal support for various political groupings in the united states so it's it's interesting that the overall machine does address all orthodoxy as its enemy rather than simple jurisdictions or even it doesn't really even prioritize maybe it does within itself but at least this article was the first sort of blanket attack on all orthodox jurisdictions within the united states which i found very curious but we really appreciate the practical advice because i guess um it's difficult for a local parish priest to even say what you just said to even add a sermon perhaps after the liturgy or you know, let alone after the gospel reading, so or even before the gospel reading. So it would, I think, actually be very pertinent for all, I guess, American clergymen, you know, priests, abbots, you know, whose monasteries receive a large, large number of attendees, or even bishops, to consider the fact that yes, the the State Department, the various uh, secret service groups in the United States, the FBI, um, Homeland Security, they will be looking into Orthodox parishes individually and even collectively at what's being published online on websites. And that doesn't mean we have to somehow change what we speak about, but we need to be extremely careful and cautious, especially, as you mentioned, of provocateurs or people who perhaps aren't on the same level mentally or intellectually as as regular people, for example, and that are a, you know that could be exploited in order to negatively attack orthodox communities i think that's you know we've spoken about that before privately but i've never heard an orthodox clergyman say it so i think we're very grateful about that yeah i think people need to be aware of that i mean i back when the early in the early stages of the war on terror i wasn't aware that that stuff was going on but uh you had lefty independent reporters like glenn greenwald that were exposing that but i wasn't paying attention to those guys back then but i've started paying attention to those guys <laughs> because uh they they've they've ex exposed a lot of this kind of garbage you know you said the greeks have been very cooperative well i would say they've been very cooperative in demonizing the russian church too and public orthodoxy in particular is spewing out a steady stream of stuff to try to vilify the Russian church and make us out to be, uh, you know, bloodthirsty demons that are, you know, just looking to kill children and stuff. Um, so I, I hope maybe some of these people are waking up to the fact that once the Orthodox church is in the crosshairs, that there might not be a lot of distinctions made by the people who probably didn't know what the Orthodox church was, you know, two weeks ago. I definitely agree. And you know, between that and, you know, Sarah Riccardi Schwartz, we were talking about this off air, how she was basically more mad that she wasn't consulted on the article as opposed to, you know, the actual slanderous yeah. nature of it. She did call say it was doing broad strokes, but her focus was trying to demonize Russians specifically, like you said, you know, at the sort of behest of a certain group of people within the Greek Orthodox community up in New York and Boston and those sorts of places. But what she's also done, to... though, her whole book is about how these crazy converts in the Russian church abroad are all just waiting to whip out their Soviet banners and AK 47s and uh, to join in uh, the, the fight when Putin invades the United States. I mean, she literally talks about this as if this is some serious possibility. And uh, so I'd say she's she's even worse uh, th than the average. But uh, but but yeah, they're 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 doing this and and it, it's it's bad enough when you have enemies from the outside but when you get stabbed in the back by people from your own church it's more, more painful and we had abbot trifon on recently i'm sure by the time you're listening to this that episode will have already dropped but he i mean when it comes to the greeks and you know working with americans and everything we also just can't deny the influence that the state department has over the ecumenical patriarch and the whole situation in ukraine and how that's exactly I mean, look, I mean, I'd imagine if I was Elpidophoros or Patriarch Bartholomew or one of these more pro-Ukrainian bishops, especially in America, I'd be pretty frustrated. Like, man, we did all of this. We supported your schismatic project over there and you're still 
lumping us in with everybody else, huh? And that's that's exactly what it is. It's it ultimately it is the gospel that's the that's being persecuted. It's not the politics. It's just kind of the dressing that all of this takes in any different age. So of course you're going to get lumped in with us. As insofar as in America there are very faithful, very strong communities. I'm an hour away from a monastery founded by Elder Ephrem, and sure they're under Go Arch, but it's one of the most traditional, <laughs> beautiful faithful places I've ever been. So, of course, these places are going to come into conflict with the modern world. But, Father, when it comes to, um, in general, the the situation in America, we talked about this a little bit off air as well. The Assembly of Bishops, we know Rokor isn't a part of it due to the situation in Ukraine. But I said this before, the, 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 the everybody else outside of Goarch on the Assembly seems to be pretty united insofar as rejecting both crazy things like the elevation of Alexander Belia and even the more extreme things from like public orthodoxy. Like we had an episode where we went line by line through their treatise against like the so-called Russian world heresy and that whole thing. I know you wrote about that as well, Father John. And when it comes to the, like I'm in the Antiochian church, we, you know, I have friends in all the jurisdictions and, you know, especially in the midst of all of this, it seems that uh, the assembly and is, very much both on the side of the persecuted church in Ukraine and at this point willing to put aside whatever differences there are with the Russians and the Greeks seem to be having to kind of just accept that because they got lumped in as well. I'm, I'm wondering your thoughts on the on the general assembly situation. Well, you, you know, the last I heard, the Greeks were planning on going ahead and making Belia bishop. And if that happens, the other jurisdictions have said that that's the end of their participation in the Assembly of Bishops. So I would say that the Assembly of Bishops day is maybe numbered. Well, then maybe it'll just be a reverse situation as now, except just Go Arch will be on the outside, but probably be yeah. something formed pretty quickly between, you know, Metropolitan Nicholas, Metropolitan Saba, you know, the Serbian bishops and whatnot. I, I guess we'll be curious to see how that how something like that goes but it's such a shame because you know on the local level in houston we have a really good clergy association we cooperate and we we were able to serve together i mean i think we had a, a something really uh, good that was going and we still have it to some extent but this this stuff is has has made a lot of that difficult and it's it's it's, it's such a shame and if the, the problem is we have we have people in the ecumenical patriarchate on the leadership level, namely the bishops, that they're not worried about advancing the the gospel or bringing people into the church as much as they are pleasing the State Department. And even when it comes to promoting the the uh, Skittles garbage, they seem to be caving on that. I mean, they haven't gone as far as Pope Francis with opening the door to blessing gay marriages, but I would say they're probably not you know too too far behind that and uh so it's it's a shame because it's it's a betrayal of orthodoxy that we're witnessing now most of the people in the greek archdiocese i don't think are on board with that and certainly the ephraimite monasteries are not going to be on board with that so you know at, at some point if they continue down that road there's going to be a split and i think that the good folks are going to be on the same side as the rest of the church yeah, I think in many ways, I was actually pleased to see it was in, it was your bishop, Father, uh, I saw Archbishop Peter uh, Metropolitan Saba and uh, Metropolitan Nathaniel, Archbishop Nathaniel of uh, Chicago, they, I think, celebrated a memorial service together. So I was pleased to see that. And I remember, I think Metropolitan Nathaniel had a surprisingly refreshing take during some of the COVID stuff, really refusing any of the multiple spoons stuff. So I was, I, I wasn't expecting that from him at the time. But now, the situation in Ukraine continues to poorly affect, you know, Orthodox unity around the world. And, of course, there's the situation with the African Exarchate as well. And some of the, and that, that I mean, that directly ties into almost more, like, directly mirrors the situation we talked about with Alexander Belia. For those who don't know, the Greeks are trying to start a Slavic vicariat in the United States to sort of poach, I guess, Russian communities from, you know, the Russian church abroad. And... That is also then, of course, now the Af the Russians have the African Exarchate, which there's actually a myriad of reasons why Africans are seeking to join the the Russian Exarchate beyond just the actual schism in Ukraine issues, actual you know personal you know reasons where they would feel that's valuable to pursue. But that also kind of leads us into I want to have maybe a broader discussion about that. That will then lead us into this. This was in mid September from Ortho Christian. Uh, there seems to be some developing conversations between a possible communion between the Malankara Oriental Orthodox 
you know, church in India and uh, the Moscow Patriarchate? Well, as far as the Exarchate in Africa, it's the result of the Patriarch of Alexandria recognizing the schismatics in Ukraine, and he had been very close to Metropolitan Anufri and had spoken publicly in Ukraine and encouraged the people to remain faithful to Metropolitan Anufri. And, you know, sounded like he was going to remain rock solid. But I think what happened is, is our State Department used its influence on the, the government in Greece, and Greece funds the Alexandrian Patriarchate to a large extent, and they probably just told him, look, you want to keep getting that money or not? And uh, apparently the money was more important than standing for the truth. And uh, it's a shame because, you know, the Alexandrian Patriarchate in Africa had done a lot of good. I mean, there's a lot of growth that we've seen among uh, the sub-Saharan African dioceses that they have. And you know, it's it's unfortunate to see these kinds of divisions. And the Russian church didn't do anything for a good while after this move was made. And I think they would have rather not gone down that road. But, you know, a, a lot of people minimize what's going on and say, oh, well, you know, it's not likely to end in a schism. And it's certainly not a full-blown schism at this point, but it's on the way to becoming a full-blown schism, the way things are going right now. So short of some real repentance and uh, or a change in direction at least uh, on the part of um, the ecumenical patriarchate and the patriarchate of alexandria especially this could go all the way i hope it doesn't but uh, in in many ways it's a repeat of what happened with the living church in russia in the 20s and 30s because you actually you you had uh, maletios metaxakis who was patriarch of Constantinople. And I can't remember, if, I think maybe it was his successor in Constantinople that recognized the living church. But then he became the patriarch of Alexandria and he recognized the living church too. So you had those same two patriarchates recognizing the modernist, schismatic living church and uh, who, who had a, a an agenda that, that no pious Orthodox Christian should have ever thought was a good thing. And uh, and you, you see today they're kind of pushing the same kind of stuff. The church in Ukraine has already signaled it's soft on uh, the the Skittles garbage. And they're also wanting to unite with the Uniates in Ukraine. And so maybe it'll end the same way where the, the schismatics in Ukraine wind up being uh, withering on the vine, and then the ecumenical patriarchate and Alexandria can just kind of act like, oh, well, that was then and this is now, and maybe it didn't even really happen. Maybe you just dreamed it. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I, I wouldn't count on that. So anybody who's in those jurisdictions should be talking to their bishops and raising some cane because this is this is very dangerous. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a, a, a division that will probably divide not just those churches, but it will divide some other churches too. Yeah, I think it's very important just to emphasize the fact that, well, it seems like the Russian church and its missionary actions in Africa is actually, in fact, really deeply going on the offensive. So in terms of like the leading figures here, we have Archbishop or Bishop Leonid, right, who used to be the missionary priest, a bishop in Armenia, actually, for the Russian Orthodox Church. He actually moved to Africa and now he's um, in charge in his recent interview. Um, it's like a 45 minute interview where he actually spoke, Father, about the exact thing you mentioned. So he mentioned um, Metaxakis, the former patriarch of Constantinople and Alexandria. And he said that the proclamation that Alexandria has, you know, jurisdiction over all of Africa is we never accepted it. And like simply it was uncanonical. So he had, so the leading missionary bishop of Russia has that opinion. And then of course he doubled down and said that, look, the, the African priests simply don't want to co-celebrate with schismatic Ukrainians. And that's, that's, right. that, that's that. So he, and he, it was actually the first interview in almost two or three years since this project began where he explicitly, you know, it's rare to see sort of hierarchs give that sort of direct opinion. And I guess it's good for us to have some clarity. And of course the leading priest, you know, uh, Bishop Lina doesn't have a YouTube channel or an online presence, but the leading priest in charge of the missionary efforts in Africa, Father George Maximov, has a YouTube channel with 50 to 60,000 subscribers. We could link his channel in the description just for, like, for information's sake. All his videos are in Russian, but it's interesting that his opinion mirrors that of, of his missionary bishop. And recently, I mean, he... And, you know, he, that's simply like the opinion that the Russian church has, whether, whether it's right or it's wrong. People just need to be aware of that's the 
over that's the dominant position we assume patriarch kirill probably has that position too and after seeing what's happening in ukraine naturally the betrayal of metropolitan onufri which is i guess it's not just a light betrayal it's a betrayal in its totality not just personal friendship but also jurisdictionally you could say um ecclesiastically canonically so you can see photographs so the patriarch of alexandria has met up with a false metropolitan epiphany dumenko multiple times since the you know since the schism began and they've you know they've obviously hung out after the liturgy they've you know spoken many times they they know the i'm assuming the patriarch of alexandria knows the canons and church tradition very very well more than any even more than any of us here but how would he how does how's this how does this kind of combine in his in his mind we're not too sure but nevertheless and there have not been any prayers at least public or public proclamations from the patriarch of alexandria or even the ecumenical patriarch towards Mitchbolt and Anufri, it's almost like Anufri does not exist. It's like he disappeared off the face of the earth. And this sort of ignorance, it's almost like akin to perhaps, I mean, we, we can make a political analogy, but it's almost like in America, the right wing was ignored for a very long time, especially pre-Trump. It was like, okay, well, if we don't bring up the American nationalists or any of these far right movements, we can just simply pretend they don't exist. And we can pretend that political movement simply isn't there. And we don't bring them to mainstream media channels. And then now, of course, we have figures like Tucker Carlson or even, you know, even more far right figures appearing in social media circles and fi finally making a voice for themselves. It's it seems like the suppression of the voice of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church is the strategy they're going for at the moment and simply, you know, publicizing Dumenko even more because well, if we give him legitimacy through making him appear on our social media channels, that'll kind of legitimize him as the face of this new pro-Zelensky, pro-European um, Ukrainian Orthodoxy, which is a shame because at this point, oh, well, myself, I'm not even sure if he's ordained properly. Probably not, but you know, who knows? So, in fact, it's yeah, it's quite sad what's what's happening over there, and of course, it affects all of us here. Not only are our taxpayer dollars going towards all of that degeneracy happening abroad, but also, in fact, it trickles down. It's like Reagan Reaganomics trickle down economy. What what happens at the top of the fish's head, of course, ends up at the tail, and the tail end being our local communities. Right. I'm sure you saw when Tucker Carlson was uh, interviewing various Republican candidates for the presidency and Pence got on there and he started pressing them on the persecution of the uh, Orthodox Church in Ukraine. And Pence said, oh, I spoke with the head of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church and he said that there was no persecution. And unfortunately, <laughs> Tucker Carlson didn't have a, a, enough awareness of what he was talking about to realize that he was talking about epiphony. But, uh, you know, that that's what he was talking about. So this is the it's, it's just there's the parallels with the Soviet Union are so similar because, oh, no, there's no persecution. <laughs> no, nothing's going on. And yet you see them them stealing churches and then locking them up because they when they steal these churches more often than not, they don't have any people going there. And uh, same thing with monasteries and all of that. It's just, you know, Christians in the West, if, if they if they didn't think that they were actually getting their news from sources they could trust, maybe they would pay attention to alternative media and they would be more aware of this. But most of them have no clue. This is not being reported in the mainstream media. Other, you know, Tucker Carlson is one of the few people who actually a lot of people listen to who's talked about this. Well, hey, that's why World War Now is here, am I right? You know, shameless <laughs> plug, shameless plug. But I think that's a pretty good transition. And, you know, we actually talk a lot about, from a geopolitical perspective, India and its relationship with Russia specifically on this show. And Ortho Christian, this was on September 13th, but I think I wanted, this is a, a good chance to get Father John's perspective on this broad question. What is it? I believe Patriarch Kirill said, you testify to orthodoxy in a non-Christian nation. That's Patriarch Kirill to the Malankara primate, who I guess goes by Catholico, Catholicos Basilios Marthoma Matthews III. And it, it appears that he just completed a six-day visit to Moscow. And there's now been some discussion that, I mean, remember, this is the Malankara, the Indian branch of the Oriental Orthodox Communion. So your Copts, Armenians, Ethiopians, Syriacs, these people, they um, completed this, I guess, trip to uh, to Russia, and now there's discussion that they might be entering into communion with the Russian Orthodox Church. And you know, this is this is very interesting. Of course, it raises questions as to how that might happen. We don't have a lot of details right now, but in general, I mean, this is a schism that's been happening since the you know Fourth Ecumenical Council, the Council of Chalcedon, which was 
where the what the Oriental Orthodox communion has in dispute with with regular Orthodoxy. And so, Father John, I was just wondering, like, if this were to happen, what would that have to look like? Well, the key issue would be that they would have to recognize the seven ecumenical councils. You can't just sweep under the rug the four, fifth, sixth, and seventh ecumenical councils and say that they were all big misunderstanding. And I'm sure that that's going to be part of it if it actually goes all the way. They're actually, I'm, I, I, I'm trying to remember the specifics, but I know Metropolitan Kostos talked about it in his book, The Orthodox Church, but before the revolution, the Russian church brought in some, some group of uh, Oriental Orthodox in, into communion with the church. And I think they, uh, it might have been that they were in Persia or something like that, and they were getting wiped out. So a lot of them were actually killed. But uh, but for a brief time, at least, they were they had been united back into the Orthodox Church. So this is something the Russian Church has worked on in the past. And I know it seems like the Russians have always had a soft spot for the Ethiopians, too. And and I think that they've generally looked at some of these isolated churches like the Malankara and the Ethiopians as sort of victims of geography because the fact that they were cut off from communication with the rest of the church probably is more of the reason why they wound up separated than anything else. And so maybe it's a little easier to reunite those people as opposed to like when you're talking about the cops in English in, in, in uh, Egypt, to ever get them to condemn Dioscorus would be a pretty big uh, leap, I'm afraid. But maybe you could have that happen for the Malankara. I don't know, but we'll, we'll have to see. Yeah, for all those interested in the uh, theology, I suppose I, I do recommend visiting, you know, our good friend Jay Dyer, his YouTube channel, as well as uh, the channel of David Erhan, a colleague of ours, who essentially breaks down this schism that occurred many years ago between our church and the denomination of the um, of this particular schismatic slash heretical group, and it kind of it kind of gets really deep into the theology. But if those of you interested in actually getting down to you know the details, the nitty gritty, I think that's pretty important considering that well perhaps um, Patriarch Kirill's uh, diplomatic efforts will bring fruits. And I mean Patriarch Kirill, he's if anything he's a diplomat, so he's really. He's not a critical bishop like you read about bishops who are sometimes criticize not just criticize their own government, especially in the lives of saints. You read about we've spoken about bishops in the past, like Bishop Job or um, some metropolitans of Moscow who've done so, or even Patriarch Tikhon who you know criticized the Bolsheviks very heavily. Patriarch Kirill doesn't act that way. In fact, his his modus operandi is very diplomatic, not just in foreign pol political, but also to, uh, internally. So even when the um, when the Ukrainian conflict began eight years ago, he was very much, you know, he preferred to resolve everything through peace. And that was his aspiration in terms of peaceful church relations. So whenever um, Mitch Bolton, Onufri's uh, clergyman, his hierarchs even spoke of something like autocephaly, given the fact that the Donbass conflict was happening, Patrick Ewell never condemned those sort of discussions. He actually just let them be. And it seems that this particular kind, you can say very polite attitude towards even neighbors has brought some fruits. And you have these Malankara, you know, Christians from, from abroad actually visiting and venerating various <laughs> Russian Orthodox relics in St. Petersburg and Moscow. It's just very, very curious. But I think you're right, Father, and uh, I think most of us historically should just, we should reiterate the fact that these schisms haven't been resolved or even there's been no progress on their resolution over the last few like decades or even hundreds of years was simply because of their geographical isolation. And we completely agree. Look there, even on if you open up Google Maps, you map out where these communities are primarily centered. Even the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, it's surrounded by essentially the the heart of the Islamic world. And in fact, their main focus, of course, is on, I guess, um, survival of some of sorts. And they simply neither nor don't have the resources, nor do they have the um, ability to communicate with, I guess, the correct Eastern Orthodox church and i mean our churches which were very far away so in fact and some of them are even the under direct islamic yoke and so it's it's been it's been very difficult for them to kind of even get in touch with you know ourselves but now in the age of the internet now you have you can just as easily send a send an email or even make a phone call abroad and simply resolve these issues or or even speak to representatives of other denominations very clearly. So I think, yeah, of course, we're seeing the bad side of this, which is ecumenism, very openly and broadly. Ecumenism has ramped up to an insane degree. We see this in the Roman Catholic Church very explicitly, but we also see a positive side to where finally 
various schisms perhaps could be healed. You know, uh, an example of this would be the Macedonian church reuniting with um, the Serbian mm -hmm. church. And well, that was completely unexpected, right? But I think uh, modern communication means today allow us to openly discuss problems at, you know, transparently in the open without really hiding any uh, hiding any of the issues. And so I think who knows what the outcome could be long term, but I think definitely um, the modern 21st century with all of its downsides does provide this providentially, of course, provide us this opportunity to finally, um, you know, for the light of orthodoxy to spread to these very far off isolated communes. Yeah, if, if the Malankara wound up in communion with the rest of the church, it would certainly put us in a much better position to actually evangelize India because mm. you're instead of this being some new missionaries from the West, these would be Orthodox Christians that have been in India since apostolic times. And, you know, we're talking about, I think they're now the largest country in the world in terms of population. I think they passed China. So yep. it's a, a huge missionary field. Yeah. And I mean, just for clarity, this is a million people. This is a million person, you know, church. So that's bigger than multiple autocephalous jurisdictions of the current Eastern Orthodox right. Church. And like Dimitri said, the Macedonian, you know, that's, you know, over 2 million people brought back into communion with the church, which is a fantastic thing as well. And this is also one of those things that as stuff like this happens, whether it's Macedonians who are on their own or, you know, a segment of the Oriental communion coming and becoming Orthodox, this, this really, really refutes the the neo-papalism that certain characters in the Fanar are trying to push right now, that only they can issue tomos of autocephaly and all these, and that all the barbarian lands, which is everywhere outside of, you know, the current orthodoxy they have jurisdiction over, it doesn't really seem like, like that, that's just, the Holy Spirit is not revealing that as the truth, and I don't think any other jurisdictions are interested in recognizing that as, as orthodox. And I guess that leads to a broader question, Father, if this is too broad, you can you can bring us elsewhere. But I'm wondering in this regard that, you know, you hear that the title ecumenical patriarch, I've heard some say it's somewhat of a redundancy and that there is no longer an empire. There's really no, no emperor to actually call a proper ecumenical council. But as we see the Russian worlds and the Russian church's capability to interact with churches in Africa and now their talk with, you know, the Malankara community, as we sort of re-enter this, we enter the more multipolar world, as it were, is it true that perhaps as orthodoxy continues to revitalize in Russia and in a few more decades as it institutionalizes itself again, is is the Russian world and the Russian Orthodox Church perhaps emerging as the ecumenical, I guess, church of the 21st century? It's certainly possible. You know, if the prophecies about there being a new czar happen, you know, in our lifetimes, that would be that would put things in a very different light because you would have an Orthodox emperor that could actually convoke an ecumenical council. So it'd be quite a different change of, uh, of uh, the circumstances in the church. Yeah. that's, we talk about that all the time on the show. Of course, we've talked about, you know, the prophecies of St. Seraphim of Viritsa, the prophecies of, you know, St. Paisios and, you know, St. Cosmas even, and, and others. We, of course, we really, you know, Metropolitan Theophytos has talked a lot about about these things in our time as well, who, you know, we really respect on this show. But yeah, it seems that, you know, especially in the midst of some of this stuff with Roman Catholicism and some of this danger we're hearing about 2025 and now this sort of this sort of unified front we're seeing develop between, you know, the the establishment, which is, you know, the modernists in the Vatican, and then the fringe groups like Fordham and the others in uh, certain people in like Finland and Sweden. Their, their perspective on orthodoxy with this, you know, the Pope Francis just opened the door to female deacons. We know we have voices in academic orthodoxy that want the exact same thing, you know, the, the, the St. Phoebe's conference, you know, for female deacons and whatnot. Obviously, in orthodoxy, we're much farther away from that than the Roman Catholics seem to be. But I, I've always thought, and this isn't something I think positively of, but that that might be the mechanism with which that new ecumenical kind of vision for a united church, for a for, a, for lack of a better term, an imperial church to come about if, you know, a certain subset of of our communion ends up joining Rome in its in its current state of apostasy. Right. You know, God uses everything to bring about his purposes, and it could very well be that these things are going to be used to make it obvious to people where they need to be. 
Thank you so much for listening to the free preview of Ether Hour, everybody. That'll be it. This was a pretty long free preview this time, wasn't it? So be sure to get behind the paywall, worldwarnow.substack.com. It really helps us out. You get access to all of our other episodes. We gave you Abbott Trifon for free last week, so be sure to show that support if you liked that, if you like what we're doing here. It really, really does help us out. We talk with Father John behind the paywall about Catholicism, Orthodoxy, potential union stuff, his Lodwell Orthodox Fellowship speech and evangelism in the South and Dixie. And we talk about a bunch of other things as well, World War III and stuff like that. So, yeah, be sure to support us, worldwarnow.substack.com. And thank you so much for listening. God bless.